while Zion is on uh, so we can all see each other's faces. Ziona, thank you for joining us. Very much appreciated. Uh, and, and you're in Denver? Yeah, I am. I'm in Boulder. So no, I'm okay. totally lying. <laughs> I'm 45 minutes away. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I, I knew you were front range. I just didn't know what exact city. So yeah. um, awesome. Thanks for giving up your time today. I, I quickly will just kind of give you a, a rundown of what this group is um, yeah. and, and who's on the call today. And then uh, kind of tell you how we'll, how we'll move forward. We have um, a bunch of young people from all across the country in our, in our Sheik's Freaks Mastermind group. And today we actually have a new member who is, who is in from India, um, where it's oh, awesome. currently 4.30, 5 in the morning. I'm not sure. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> I think we have one, one guy from Canada on, too. And so this is a group of young people anywhere from... 14 to 25, uh, who are super motivated around early financial independence, real estate investing, entrepreneurship, side hustles, earning extra income, frugality, mindsets, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and it's a pretty amazing group of young people. Uh, and so we love having guests on so that they can basically interview you, hear your story, and, and learn as much as they can. And in this case, I think I'm going to learn as well. Um, I don't know if, if, you know, may, maybe Craig told you, but my wife and I have one house down in the Springs that is a full-time Airbnb short-term rental and it, it kills it. Like it's, it's amazing. Um, but we, I think we probably originally got the idea from a podcast that you were interviewed on years ago. And we were like, well, we got to give this a shot too. So, uh, and then on this call, we have a, a good amount of young people who either are in the process of closing on their first short-term rental. They're in, they're in the hunt for buying their first short-term rental, or they will definitely be doing that in the future. So they all knew you were going to be on. That's why they're here. They probably have some great questions for you. Um, and so, yeah, I think to, to kick it off, Ziana, if you could just take five or 10 minutes or however long you want, uh, and just kind of tell everyone your story. Um, and how you got into short-term rentals and real estate investing and what you're up to nowadays and all that good stuff. We'll start there. Okay. First, I want to say that if you were on here last week and you were hoping to see my face, I was on a beach in Mexico. I had just ordered a cocktail and then I died inside when I realized that I was missing you guys. And I'm so sorry for that because I never want to be too cool to help people out. So, so sorry if you were here last week and I'm so glad that you're here now. Um, I got started in college, which maybe sounds really old for some of you guys, but um, it's a great time to start. I think getting started young is so exciting. So I just love that you guys are already after it. But basically the way I got started in Airbnb was really accidental. Um, a friend of mine that was living in New York City, kind of like on the early days of Airbnb, he had started doing it a little bit. He had gotten laid off from work. Um, and he was really burnt out and he was like, I just want to travel the world, but I have this apartment that I have this really expensive rent. And so instead of breaking his lease and, and paying a bunch of money, he said, like, I heard about this Airbnb thing that's new. I'm going to try it out um, and see how it is. And he was just hoping, you know, hopefully I can just discount my rent or, you know, cover it. And it turned out that he was doing so well that he continued his travels for a whole year. And he, after that year, he had made $50,000 off of this apartment that he didn't own. And back then, which was like 2011, $50,000 was like a salary. Like that was probably like a hundred thousand. I don't know, 75,000 something, but it was more money than I'd ever made. And I was like, whoa, what am I doing with my life? I should be doing that. Um, so that's how I kind of got started with it. Um, I was living in an apartment with two bedrooms and my roommate was just about to move out. And so I thought, well, you know, I had it furnished with all my stuff, even in her bedroom. And I was like, I could just get another roommate or I could try this Airbnb thing. And at that point, it was just not much of an investment for me because I had sheets, towels, furniture. And so, you know, worst case scenario, I just get a roommate. 
And it turned out to be so great that I was renting out her room. And then sometime I was renting out my room and going to stay with friends and um, trading massage for places to stay. I was doing all kinds of stuff because I was a massage therapist at the time. Um, and yeah, it just kind of morphed into a big thing for me. So I started with one apartment that I was just renting and re-renting. I ended up getting another apartment. Eventually I bought a place and was more legit. Um, and then I started buying out of state. I now own 11 properties and I've managed properties for people all over the world. So I've managed in four countries and probably 60 rentals. Um, and then when COVID happened, I realized I wanted to sort of change gears. So I did Airbnb management probably 10 years. Um, and now I sell real estate. And so if any of you guys are interested in real estate, I cannot say how like awesome it is to have a real estate license. It might be your first career if that's something what you want to do, but it is such a powerful moneymaker and it's also uh, just gives you access to so much. Um, and it's just like, yeah, it's such a great way to learn under people and get a discount on places that you buy. So I wish I had done it 10 years ago. So yeah, those are all the things you could ask me about. Um, and I'm happy to just go into any kind of stuff. I did probably, I think I bought eight places before I ever got a mortgage. And so if you want to talk about creative financing, I did a lot of that too. So happy to talk about partnerships and anything that you can throw at me. That is awesome. There's so many topics in there. And I like that you brought yeah. up the real estate license, because a lot of these guys are thinking, guys and gals are thinking about real estate licenses. Uh, actually, I think Connor, did you say you're taking your test tomorrow? Yeah, for Texas. Awesome. So there's Where one. are you in Texas, Connor? I'm in Austin. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've got a guy on my team in Houston. So oh, cool. sweet. we can talk about that later if you want. <laughs> Which random... Connor, remind me of this because I'll forget. I, I'm headed to Austin in a couple of weeks for FinCon. Me Ziana, too. You're, I'll, I'll meet you there. But Connor, you're, you're in Austin. I know Ethan is in Austin. So I need to try to meet up with you guys while I'm down there for, for coffee or something or lunch. So I need, I, I'll just write that down. I'll reach out. Any of you Texas, Texan folk who are, and there's a lot of you who are in or close to Austin, will hopefully get to meet up. Um, so that is, uh, I, I just have one question, Ziana, and then we'll get to Q&A, which is really what the meeting's all about. Um, what does your current rental portfolio look like? Yeah, so I have two medium-term rentals. So just kind of to give you a, a little breakdown, short-term rental is anything under 30 days, but usually it's like three or four nights. That's kind of like the Airbnb norm. Medium term is anything 30 days to a year, right? So there's a lot of interest in this month to month space because um, a lot of places have made under 30 days illegal. And so that gray area of kind of like no man's land, you don't need a permit, you don't need to pay extra fees to the city and all that stuff is anything above 30 days. So I've got two of those in Boulder because they made it illegal what I mean, like three or four years ago to do short-term Airbnb, unless it's your primary residence where you live. So I have some of those. Um, I have a full-time Airbnb in Colorado Springs, just like you, Dan, we're competitors. Mm -hmm. um, I've got three medium-term rentals in St. Louis, and then I've got five long-term rentals in Florida. Awesome. And now that you said that, I remember... I'm pretty sure this is accurate when you, I think you had posted pictures of your Springs Airbnb and it was very modern and chic. Is that about right? Yeah. Uh, it looks like a HGTV yes. kind of place. Yeah. And my, my wife and I, I think this is my been right before we bought ours. We're like, wow, we, we have to make ours look this good. Um, but ours is a little bit more of a small bungalow house, a two bedroom. So we yeah, kind of went with too. more of the, uh, I don't know. It, it's doing well. It's doing really well down there. Um, we got in before they changed the, the laws in the Springs, which was good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what we do now, Ziana, is we generally, uh, I think that we, we do Q and A and we'll do that until our time is up around 630 here in the mountain time zone. 
Um, and there'll be some great questions. So what they can do is either, um, guys, I think you know how to, you know, raise your hand electronically. Um, if you want to. Oh, I don't know how to see that. <laughs> Let's say uh, you can put it in the chat too. I don't know. Yeah, we've done the chat. Um, Whatever works. You can lead. You can call them out for me. Well, do you guys, well, either way, you can, you can raise up your electronic hand or you can type your question in the chat. We'll go both. Um, and Ziana, if you have your chat open, you can just start yeah, there. I and then if, if one of you isn't getting into the chat, physically raise your hand, get our attention. I, I can see all of you. So uh, okay, yeah, perfect. Ziana, take it away. Yeah. So Ben is asking, can you talk about your experience investing remotely? Um, yes, I can. So it's really that if your place is more than maybe an hour away, it's considered remote. I would consider that out of state practically because the, the truth of the matter is that if there is an emergency, you're not getting in your car for that. Um, and the thing with short-term rentals is it's different than long-term rentals where, oh yeah, you know, maybe you have something within four hours. For some reason, investors like to use four hours as that radius of something that's nearby. Yeah, you might go there once a year and check it out and, and fix some things. But when it's a short-term rental, the problems are immediate problems. Everything is like an emergency. So it's a plugged toilet. And if you only have one toilet in the house, they want it fixed in an hour, you know? Uh, it's somebody locked outside of the house where you can't get out there fast enough. So you need somebody local. So basically, if you're going to invest anywhere, you know, outside of that hour radius, I would say you need to build a little bit of a team and your team can be as small as a cleaner or two and a handyman. And so if you're working with an agent, they can give you those kinds of references usually. And you can just go from there. Over time, you're going to get your you know, specialty plumber and this and that, but um, you can really start bare bones. You just really need to have somebody you can call. Okay, great. So how do you manage your cleaners remotely? Um, so basically you kind of want to hire somebody that you know, either can do technology, which is not always easy with cleaners. Um, what people really like to use is checklists. And there are some programs that you can get like electronic checklists. You can see them checking it off and it kind of like clocks them in and out when they're at the property. Um, and so you can do something like that. If your person's really not tech savvy, you can have them send you photos. But basically what I have kind of learned over time is that your guests will report on your cleaners and your cleaners will report on your guests. And so if your guests have not been good and they left the place bad, you're going to hear about it. And then you'll be leaving them reviews around that. And then if your cleaner didn't do a great job, your guests are going to tell you about it. And so it's kind of like this checks and balances thing. But um, it sometimes takes a little while to get a really good cleaning company. Um, so, yeah, we can talk about that if you want to figure out how to hire cleaners. But basically, yeah, checklist is a good place to start. And sometimes it's good to alternate cleaners, have like maybe two different people because cleaners tend to have like a certain style and they may skip the same kinds of things over and over again um, because that's just how they like to clean. And so if you've got somebody else in there, it might be a little more thorough. Um, how did you finance eight houses without mortgages? Okay, so my first house, I went to an old landlord of mine um, and I knew that he was an investor and he owned like 17 apartments in the same complex. And I had heard through the grapevine that he had given people loans before. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to ask. <laughs> and I got up the courage and I went over there and I was super nervous and I asked him, but I laid it all out. Like I had my plan and I was telling him how much I was going to make and how it would work. And he thought it was a good idea and he was willing to help me out. So that was my first, um, when I went to buy my first place out of state, I went back to him um, and I said, Hey, you know, I, I'm wanting to do this, but he didn't feel super comfortable renting or loaning to me out of state. So he was comfortable putting a lien on the place that I had locally because he knew this market. And so that place had gone up in value. I got a bunch of equity. It was just good timing. 
And so it was able to do what we call a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit on that property. And so when I invested out of state, it was much cheaper. And so I only needed $80,000 and I took that out of that other property. And so he did both of these loans personal to me, which was great. When I did my third place, I bought that with some cash that I had saved. My fourth place, I went with um, a friend of mine, I think maybe my fourth, fifth and sixth or something. I ended up partnering with a friend that had a really easy W-2 job. And so um, if you're not familiar, when you have just a normal nine to five, you will have a W-2 very often. Um, if you're a contract employee, um, if you're doing like side hustles or, or gigging, you might be doing more 1099 style. And of course, this only applies to the U.S. But um, when you have a W-2 job, it's very predictable income. You have the same payouts every you know, two weeks or something. And so loan officers love those. It's very predictable. They know you're going to pay your mortgage because you make X amount. Um, and so it's so much easier to get a loan with that. And so if you can find a partner, sometimes you can be the person who brings all of the information or the cash or the, the ability to get a loan. And so those are all kind of like levers that you can have. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I did other creative things. But yeah, I think those last couple were just me partnering with somebody else. And then I did finally get a loan for myself. Um, let's see. Huh? Oh, sorry. I had a follow up question about that. Actually. Sure. Uh, did you said you he was basically a hard money lender, right? Yep. What was that okay? So were his rates like ten percent or fifteen percent, and they just happened to work out for the house, or were they low, like three or four percent? So I got really lucky. So generally, hard money lenders or private lenders are going to be like eight to twelve percent. Um, but because he was kind of like this older guy that wanted to help someone young getting into the business, and that's not uncommon. Um, he gave me a 5% interest only loan. And so the scary part of interest only is like, if you're not doing a flip where you're going to make some money right away, then that's going to balloon at a certain point. So I had to pay it back in five years. And when you're paying interest only, you only pay the interest and none of the principal. So in five years, my balance is exactly the same as I started, but my payments were really, really low. So that's kind of like the pluses and minuses of that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Right. Awesome. Let's see here. Um, how much time per month do you spend managing your Airbnbs? It's really minimal. It's surprising. Um, so I would say that I have maybe I have six right now that are between short term and medium term. It's probably like an hour, maybe two hours a week that I do. Oh, per month. Yeah. So maybe it's like an hour or two a week that I do with that. And it's because the medium term rentals are so much less um, communication. Uh, I like those a lot because if someone's in your house only three or four nights, they are just learning your house. They're like, where's the trash and how do I get in and what do I do with things? Um, and so there's a lot of communication sometimes when someone's in your house for a month or three months, those first couple of days, they're communicating with you. And then after that, you don't hear from them. Um, and so that's a great perk of it. You also don't have to do cleans all the time. And so um, if you have an Airbnb, you're scheduling cleans and you're kind of communicating with the cleaner and doing just a lot of back and forth. And that can be time consuming. Um, but with a, a medium term place, you do, you know, one clean a month max. Maybe it's one every three months or six months. So um, it's not only cheaper, but it's just less work. So I like that. Um, okay. How did you go about finding data for your rentals? Do you use sources like air DNA? What about sites for management? So I do use air DNA, but I don't pay for it. Um, air DNA has like a really robust analytics, um, and you can pay for it by area, but it can be kind of expensive. I'm not even sure what it is right now, but it kind of depends on if you just buy like one city or your whole state or the whole US or something like that. Um, and then what they have in AirDNA is that they have an area called Rentalizer and it's like a free tool. 
and it gives you three metrics. And so it talks to you about what your um, nightly rate would be, and you can put like any address in the US. So if you're looking at stuff on the MLS or Redfin or Zillow um, that you might wanna buy and you wanna run some numbers, this is a really great tool to use. Um, so it tells you your nightly rate, it tells you what your average occupancy is gonna be, and then what you could make in a year. And you have to be a little careful there with the averages because um, Airbnb is really seasonal. And so you'd kind of have to learn like what your area is like, but with an average, you can see a little bit about like, can you cover your monthly expenses with it? But you have to be really good about like when you're making so much money in your high season, don't blow it all because you've got to have that carry you through through your low season. Um, and then sites for management. So if you're going to do medium term or long term rentals, there's apartments.com. It used to be called Cozy, but they just changed it. Um, and that site's awesome. So people can apply in there um, and you can get background checks and um, credit checks and that kind of stuff, eviction report. Um, but you can also have people pay their rent automatically and they can pay via credit card or bank. Um, and you could kind of track all that stuff in there. So it's really great and it's totally free. So if you end up doing kind of like medium term stuff in there, you can also uh, keep like your lease in there. They can buy um, renter's insurance through them. So it's a pretty cool like spot for management. Um, do you use property management often? I do all my own property management just because it's like the way to make the most money. Um, if you're doing long-term properties, property management is usually like six to 10%. If you're doing something like medium term, uh, it could be like more 15%. And if it's a short term rental, it can be 20 to 40%. There's not a lot of places out there that are going to make 40% returns and then you can pay a manager and then you make any money. Like, so because it's so little um, time and it's just a really great way to learn, I think it's better to just self-manage if you can do it. Um, let's see, it says... What do you know about the benefits of property management network? I don't know property management's network. So if you want to follow up with that, feel free to. Um, how did you find good partnerships? What was your worst fear with a partnership? Okay, partnerships are like marriages. So if you're buying a rental, the best way to buy one is to think that you're going to be owning it for at least 10 years and maybe forever. You know, anytime I bought a house, I was like, I'm going to have it forever. And I have sold one and I'm working on selling one now, but um, that was just kind of the way that I had always forecasted it. And I think that that's a good way to think about it. And so if you're buying with a partner, are you going to be with them for 10 years or 30 years? Um, and what does that look like as your lives change? So that's the part that's a little bit tricky um, same as in a relationship, it's really important that you have good communication and that you are really clear about what your roles are and what is going to happen in all the worst case scenarios. So there are operating agreements that you can get on sites like Rocket Lawyer and Legal Zoom. I think there's different ones like that. Um, and so we filled out something like that, that had like prompts, um, and it made it really easy, but what I would say about my partners, when I was looking for partnership at the beginning, I wanted people that wouldn't get in my way or tell me what to do or try to take over. And so I had people come that had either some money or an easy job, and they were just going to let me do everything. But over time, I don't want to do everything anymore. <laughs> so these partners are not the same as what I wanted in the past. And that's because I changed and my goals have changed. So Nowadays, I look for partners that maybe know more than me or that are willing to use my help and knowledge, but actually do the work. And so that kind of changes over time. And it's important to sort of have a, an, an exit strategy if that comes up for you. Um, let me get back here. Yeah, I think the worst fear is just that something bad happens. I have like a bad story about a partnership that went bad. So I can go into that later if we have more time. Um, do you automate your short-term rental processes? If so, please talk about it. Uh, I do. And so there, there is an app 
that they just changed their name from smart BNB to hospitable. I don't like it. But um, what it does is it does auto messaging, which is super key to have. Um, the thing is that people are going to ask you all the same questions all the time. They're going to ask you like where to park and what's the door code and what's the Wi-Fi. And so it has a way of reading the messages with their AI, capturing the keywords and like sending out automated messages so that you don't have to do that much messaging. So I really like that. Um, and then it also, if someone instant books, it sends them everything they need. So I love doing that. The things that I think that you absolutely need as a short-term rental operator is you need automation on your pricing. So I have um, a company that I like for that. If you want info, let me know. Um, the automated messaging is nice to have, but you don't need it right away, especially if you have one property, you have time to just do it on your own. Um, but what's nice with the automated software is that it also automatically sends emails to the cleaners so that they can schedule themselves. So I kind of like having like a small smart calendar or something like that. So that's basic. Like that's all you need. People sell you all kinds of other gadgets, but really pricing is the main one. So are cleaners a good start as opposed to property management? Yes. Your cleaner can be trained to be a little bit like a property manager. It sort of depends on your relationship, but I have cleaners that manage other cleaners. I have cleaners that will do weeding and stuff in the garden as well as cleaning. I have cleaners that will go run errands if we need to buy stuff. Most of the stuff we order online and it like comes to the house, but just kind of knowing that if you've got somebody and they're like, $20 an hour or $25 an hour, you can generally hire them for other things. So they can kind of become your property manager if you need them to. Um, they're also asking, do you use other sites besides Airbnb? Um, I would say start with Airbnb. It's the most user-friendly one. But if you're like not getting fully booked and you want some other options, I would get really good at Airbnb for the first like three, six months. And then add Verbo or VRBO, which is Vacation Rental by Owner. Um, that one is really great as well, but it has like a different clientele. And so it might help you fill in some gaps. Um, but it's also more expensive than VRB or than Airbnb. So, you know, pros and cons. And then the third, I would say eventually, if you got really good at VRBO again, um, is Booking.com. But Booking.com is hard to use. So warning. Okay, are you getting most of your MTR? What's that? <laughs> Does somebody know what MTR is? Connor? Uh, sorry, medium term rentals. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, are you getting most of your MTR through Airbnb or other sites? Okay, so I love using Airbnb for medium term. You can just set minimum 30 days, but then you have to be really careful about your calendar. So I usually don't do instant book because people will just book anywhere and then you'll have these awkward gaps. Um, and those are sometimes hard to fill if it's illegal to rent under 30 days. So I generally have them send me a message and then I chat with them a little because sometimes people can come a week earlier and they're like really flexible. Um, and so you can have less gaps. And I also sometimes only open my calendar like a month or five weeks at a time and just kind of see. Um, but it is a good place to find some traveling nurses and, and people that will come to town for a month. It's gotten really popular since COVID that people will go work from home in another town. And so they'll come for like a month and then they'll go to the next cool town and test places out. And so that's been great because Airbnb, you can get so much more money um, and you're kind of attracting people that at least here in Denver, they might be coming from New York or LA where they pay $3,000, $4,000 a month in rent when here we only pay $1,200. And so it's normal for them to pay $3,000 and then they'll pay that, which is great. Um, the other site that I love for medium term rentals is Furnish Finder. So Furnish Finder is primarily uh, traveling nurses and doctors, um, and they have terms of three months and then sometimes they extend to six. So they'll do two terms. Um, and they're great tenants. They're usually not there very much because they're at the hospital. Um, and yeah, you know, they're employed and they're not going to stay beyond their lease. You don't have to evict them. It's pretty safe and great. 
So I like using them as well. And sometimes if you're doing kind of both, you can do Airbnb in your high season and really get a lot of money and then do furnish finder kind of in your low season to sort of fill a big gap. So that's kind of how I use it. Okay, from Jacob, since you have short, medium and long-term rentals, which one is your favorite? Um, gosh, I mean, I have a lot of love for short-term rental because it got me to where I am today and I just really appreciate it. Plus I love to travel. And so the idea of like going to stay in places and still use them, I think is really cool, but i like that medium term is less work. The long-term is even less work. So my kind of, my journey is moving towards brand new construction, long-term rentals. And I started with hundred year old homes in gentrifying neighborhoods that, you know, I was doing short-term rental and it's because short-term rental sometimes can make you the most money and a hundred year old home that is kind of run down in a scary neighborhood is sometimes the only thing you can afford. So you start in a certain place, but once you make some money, you go, Hey, a brand new home is going to be way less maintenance and long-term rental is going to be something that someone else could manage. And that's great. So it's sort of the spectrum of like, when you have the privilege and you've got the extra money, great. But for now, hustle and do what makes you the most money. Um, which has the best return on investment, both in terms of money, but also in time investment. So I would still say short term in the right area. So it sort of just depends. Short term doesn't work everywhere. And so you want to make sure that your expenses are not going to drown you because there are a lot of expenses and a lot of hidden stuff. And people love to brag about short term rental and be like, oh, I made a hundred thousand on this house. But like, what did they net? What are they keeping in profit after all their expenses? It's probably 30 or 40. So they can suck it. Um, but yeah, okay, so let's see here. Yeah, I would say I have some long-term rentals that make me great uh, returns, but you just have to find them. And it's just harder sometimes. Okay, have you found that AirDNA is accurate? I think so. Um, I've tested it against places that I manage myself and I generally beat it a little bit. And I think it's because you know they're looking at everyone and some people just don't manage as well or something, you know, maybe they're not as aggressive about pricing, um, but I think it's pretty good. Okay, Abby had to leave. Let's see. Oh, Connor's under contract for short-term rental in the Smokies. Um, yeah, if you don't know about the Great Smoky Mountains, kind of Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, it is expensive, but it is a great place to do short-term rental. Um, he's saying, do you have any advice for making a property stand out with a lot of competition in that market? I know that market pretty well. I have a friend who runs a big real estate company there and manages a lot of rentals. I don't think that it's oversaturated. And I kind of have this idea that every property is unique. And so people are going to be attracted to your property for whatever reason, you know, no two properties are going to be furnished exactly the same or the same location and stuff. So the best that you can do is in your photos and your furnishing. And, you know, sometimes people start out and they're really like bootstrapping it and you've got to just put basic furniture and, and get it going, but definitely get professional photos. And if you can over time reinvest in your furniture and make it look better, do that because that's, what's really making you money is that people are looking at just a tiny little thumbprint of your place. Um, and it's got to stand out in that like, you know, 20 seconds that they're looking at it. So um, that's kind of like the only thing you can do. You can write the coolest description ever, but if nobody clicks on your photo, then they're not going to read it. Yeah. Okay. Have you heard of use 10% down secondary vacation home loans? Okay. So there are, um, they call them second home or vacation home loans. And they are 10% down. And I have heard, but I don't know if the guy was like, not right. But he said that he had found a 5% down for that too. So maybe it depends on your market. Um, but basically what's cool about those is that it's less down. And so sometimes you can get a better return. 
What's hard about it is that because it's a second home, you have to qualify with your income. So what's great about um, having an investment property loan is that you can sometimes have the home qualify for itself. So just like if you had a long-term rental and you got um, some tenants on there on a lease agreement and it was going to pay more than your mortgage and like then some with a little good buffer, you can sometimes have that income qualify for the loan on its own. And so that's really cool. You don't have to like have a great job and all this stuff. Your house can pay for itself. Yeah. But if you have that second home loan, it's literally looking like you are buying that home just to use for yourself and that none of the income from that house can be counted. So a lot of people can't qualify for that. So just kind of know that up front. And sometimes you actually have to have a primary home loan. So if you don't own something that you're living in, sometimes they will not let you have a second home loan. So that's a good thing to think about. Um, the good thing about second home loans is that to qualify for it as well, all you have to do is have the intention of staying in the home two weeks a year. And the kind of like gray area about that is that most vacation rentals are going to have two weeks of gaps in the year. So like, but you know, don't commit mortgage fraud, try to go there anyway. So would that, <laughs> would that type of loan work well for a short-term rental? Yes, it does. Okay. Abby would like to hear the partnership story. Let's see if we get to it. Uh, Owen as well. Um, okay. So what's your best advice for lead generation as an agent? It's tricky. Um, it looks like Connor might have left, but maybe he'll watch this again later. Um, my best advice for lead generation is actually utilizing Facebook. So you guys are all probably too young to use Facebook, but maybe not. Um, it's a great tool because people will open a private message or a DM on Instagram more likely than they will answer a phone call or even look at a text message, like forget about email but you're contacting people immediately there. And so if you're trying to do lead generation, the best way to do it is to divide up all of your friends and chat with everybody once a month. And so it seems like you're just chatting away into the oblivion, but being in contact with people and networking, even if it's just online, gets you clients and it keeps you in people's minds. And so really all that real estate is, is chatting and networking and you know, having people think of you when they're gonna buy a house. Um, the cool thing about being a real estate agent is if you have a license in any state, you can refer property or you can refer clients in out of state places. And so a lot of my income is actually saying, hey, Colorado's too expensive. Let me hook you up with my guy in Memphis. So I have a few contacts that I think are really great and that I've vetted and I send people all over the country. And so you can totally do that. Um, if you're like plugged in and stuff. So it is a great way to make additional income, but you have to be licensed. Okay. So have you ever created equity in your short-term rentals using a burr strategy? No, <laughs> I don't burr. I'm not a rehab kind of gal. Um, everybody has their different kind of places in this, um, I call like the food chain of real estate. There are people that are going to get a home that is totally dying um, for a dollar on an auction, you know, and they're going to get it up to a certain point. And then the next person is going to come around and make it a little bit better or cooler or whatever. Um, but I buy the place totally done, ready to go. And I come in and I put my furniture in and then I make it make a bunch of money with Airbnb. And so I know that somebody else made money on me ahead of it, but I'm okay with that. Um, because I know where my kind of zone of genius is. This is something I'm good at and that other stuff, I'm going to lose a lot of money trying to learn. Um, but we do have a great episode about Airbnb to Burr on the Phi Team podcast, which is one that I co-host on. So I can try to get it and put it in the link here. Um, okay. So I'm liking the sound of being able to pull money out of the property yeah, everybody likes the sound of that. <laughs> the problem is that if you have no experience, people like the first thing they want to do is burr. I say the first thing you want to do in real estate is house hack or Airbnb. It is the lowest hanging fruit is the easiest thing to do. Burr is like, um, you know, that's graduation. 
So if you get to that place and you are like, I can renovate stuff, my family, they're all contractors, like, cool, get into burrs, but don't get in over your head on something that's going to be really hard when you can do something that's like easier to start. Um, is it best to get a W-2 or work under a real estate investor? Um, gosh, I feel like working under a real estate investor might be hard unless they're like a cool mentor and they want to help you out. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know exactly know what that would look like. Um, yeah, I would say rather than working under a real estate investor, I would work as a realtor. I would work as like a real estate agent. Um, but yeah, sometimes the W-2 is easy to get. It just depends on how flexible it's going to be. Because if you're working nine to five, sometimes it's hard to come home and then hustle like, you know, seven to nine. You know, a lot of people don't have the energy for that. So I'd say find out what's realistic for you. But as a real estate agent, often people can get hired as an assistant. And so they're still making a W-2 and then have the ability to do commission and learn. So sometimes you can meet a real estate agent that's an investor and learn from them. Okay. Uh, if you were to work under an investor, how can you find them and approach them? Real estate meetups are the best way to do that. So meetup.com or maybe like your local RIA, they have like real estate chapters and stuff in your town, but I would say meetup.com is good enough. Um, and just kind of go to some real estate meetups. You can find them also on bigger pockets. They list a bunch of local meetups that way. But yeah, I mean, real estate, I would say is really, it's like a friend business. If you want to have deals come through and, and find out about cool things that are unlisted, it's really about who you know, because there's so much happening off market all the time. Um, how do I put up with Craig? <laughs> Craig's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have to, I'm, I'm going to be his roommate in FinCon. So any advice oh, you can awesome. give me, that would be great. I'm just, oh I'm just gosh. kidding. I'm just if kidding. If anything, I think Craig's boring. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. If you guys don't know Craig, Craig Gerlop, he wrote the House Hacking Strategy. He's my co-host on the Phi Team podcast. So definitely check us out. But his mm. book is a great place to start. If you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to do house hacking or just getting started. It's really cool. Um, so can you make money pretty well on Airbnb, even buying on the market? Yes, you can. So people love to say, oh, well, you'll never make money in Colorado because it's too expensive and you'll never find a deal on market. I find them all the time. So it just depends on how you look for it and what your strategy is going to be rental wise. If you were just going to buy a place and rent it unfurnished and long-term, yeah, maybe the mortgage won't even cover or the rent won't even cover the mortgage and that would suck. But if you do medium-term rental and furnish it, well, okay, then you're somewhere. And then if you do short-term rental, maybe you even make more. So it's all dependent on like what you're going to do, how you're going to do it that can make the deal. Um, yeah, she, oh, Owen is saying, I can relate to the fact that I barely have experience with rehabs. So I would really rather find something easier to work with. Yeah. And another thing I'll say about that is a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I just want to put sweat equity into a place. That's cool. Again, if you're super handy or you have experience with that, but the truth of the matter is like loans are so cheap right now at about 3%. If you can find somebody that went through all the hassle of renovating a place, and then you can just lump that into the loan, it's so much easier and cheaper and quicker to do it that way most of the time because contractors are expensive and you have to chase them down. And are they going to do the work right? Um, so that's a lot of headaches, especially if it's your first place. So I lean towards getting something that's done. Um, do you use specific CRM software? Yeah, I use KB Core and I think it sucks. So I'm not helpful there. <laughs> Sorry. And that's just what we track our clients for in uh, real estate as an agent. Um, Owen is asking, are real estate brokers willing to hire 18 year old agents? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I think it's awesome. You should get out there, get your license. Like, I mean, have you watched their shows on, on uh, 
I don't know what Netflix Bravo, but they have like the, the million dollar house that I thought there were some agents on there that were like 20 and they're selling million dollar listings all the time. So, I mean, it's such an easy way to make more money than your parents ever made. Real estate is, is really powerful. Um, but what's powerful about it is taking that money and not buying a Rolls Royce or some kind of like Bentley. It is taking that money and putting it into real estate investments and then kind of building your portfolio out. So the money that real estate agents make now is much more than they really should based on the type of work and the amount of work it takes to do. And I don't think it's going to last. So if it's something you think you might want to do, I would say get into it in the next five years because soon, Zillow and technology is going to just take this career away and it's going to be automated and different. And so if you're thinking about doing it, now is the time to make lots of money and put it into other investments. Um, so Owen is saying he's looking to go about getting a license this year and has a few connections you might try to work under. Yes, I think that's so great. Um, are realtors W-2 workers? Not usually. Usually we get a 1089 and we're only commission, which is hard for some people. Um, but sometimes you can work under a real estate broker or another agent as their assistant, which allows you to learn how they do everything, maybe get some leads and clients um, and get a salary and then commission. So you can get a W-2, which is awesome. Um, Owen is also saying he's been running numbers on market for short-term rentals furnished, and it seems that it works better than long-term rentals. Yeah, generally it does. Yeah. Okay. I did it. Um, okay. Do you want to hear my bad story? <laughs> I'll tell you my bad partnership story. So I just came home from St. Louis when I bought my first property. And when I bought in St. Louis, I had gone there on a wedding um, of a really old friend. And it was the first time I'd ever been there. And I remember my friend telling me, oh my gosh, my rent's so cheap. I love living here. It's so cool, blah, blah, blah. But when I was there at her wedding, I was talking to the guests and I was saying, oh yeah, I do Airbnb. Like, what do you do? And they were all saying, oh, you know, we've heard it's so great here. We're thinking about trying it. Our friends are doing it. Um, and we kind of got to the like, how much does your home cost? And they were saying that they had a three bedroom house for $300 a month. And where I was living in Colorado, even gosh, um, it must've been five or so years ago, I was paying like $1,100 for a one bedroom apartment that I was renting and then re-renting on Airbnb. And so I kind of just did the numbers real quick in my head. And I was like, okay, if I had a three bedroom house, even if it rented like three nights, I can get $300, you know, like hundred dollars a night. There's no way to lose. Like this is going to work. Um, so I kind of went home and ran the numbers and learned everything online. And I came back exactly a month later with my home furnishing it. So I just kind of hit the ground running with that. Um, and even though it wasn't as good or as busy as Boulder, it still made great money because the homes are so dang cheap. So yeah, but to get to the story. So I came home from that deal and I was just like high as a kite. I had come here, bought my place, furnished it. And then it was totally rented before I even like left. So I had it just like rocking and it was great. Um, and so when I came home, I ran into somebody at a sandwich shop and was like, oh, I'm, you know, buying places in St. Louis and it's working so well and I'm a genius. Um, and so this guy told me, well, I would love to do that. Let's do that. And he told me that he had $10,000. And so I was like, okay, great. $10,000 is a down payment for a house that is like 50 or $60,000. Um, maybe we can kind of like split furnishings and then we can buy this place. Well, he, we kind of handshaked and stuff. Um, he never came up with the money. So we found a house, we put it under contract. We were going to buy it. And thank goodness I had the cash for it because when it came to the end of the day, um, closing table, he didn't have the money. And what ended up happening for me is that he didn't have the money for the next whole year. And so he thought in his mind that he would just help me, you know, run it. And he could just make the money off the home, making money of itself. Like the home was paying for itself, but I had to put the $50,000 in cash or whatever when we bought the house. 
And so it really turned me sour because he, you know, lied and didn't come up with the money. And so eventually we had a little lawsuit and I got the house and it only cost me about $2,000, but it was stressful. And so I don't recommend it, (laughs) but yeah, I would say, you know, the lesson there, get contracts, have operating agreements, see the money. Maybe you need to like get them to give you a copy of their bank statement or something like that. And just like, know that you have a plan because um, it can go really bad. Yeah. Oh, I think I got a new question in here too. Would it be possible to sublet Airbnb on multiple properties? Mm. Can you tell me a little bit more? Owen, just talk. Oh yeah. So sorry, I'm I'm just leaving work. <laughs> so I was uh I was wondering. So you said that you use Airbnb and you were able to uh, what was it? I guess it was basically subletting your uh, the place that you were a tenant at. Would yeah. you be able to? Would you be able to become a tenant at multiple in multiple places and then you just turn it into sort of a business and use Airbnb? Yeah. Lots of people do that. So okay, there's different ways of doing it, right? So Hmm. the easiest way to do Airbnb is that you just rent out where you live. So that might be that you rent out a room um, and you have roommates, but they are cool with you Airbnb on occasion because wherever you live, or that could be that you have a one bedroom place or something like that. You can even rent out your van and your driveway if you wanted to. But um, the cool thing about that is that you already have sheets and towels, furniture, It's really low expense. And then you can learn from doing that. So kind of renting out your space is the easiest thing. The second thing that is like a little bit harder, but just almost as easy and cheap is co-hosting or managing someone's place. So generally you need a little bit of experience before someone's going to just turn their property over to you. But maybe it's like a family member or a friend that has like a cabin that they don't rent or something that you can help them make money on and they'll be excited about it. So what's great about managing is that they have to have all the sheets and towels and supplies and furniture, and you don't have to buy any of it. And you just make a percentage off the top, which again, could be 20 to 40%. And so you're very incentivized to help them make that money um, because you only make money if they make money. But what's great about that, which is kind of called co-hosting is that, you know, just a regular old house can make maybe 500 to a thousand Um, on that kind of commission for you a month. And so if you're like, hey, my FI number or my early retirement number is like $3,000 a month or $5,000 a month, then you can say, okay, I need three houses or I need five houses. It's just that simple. Um, So the next thing that's a little bit harder is gonna be master leasing or they call Airbnb arbitrage, which is what you're talking about, Owen. And so basically that is, renting a place with the intention to like re-rent on Airbnb or sublet. Um, You generally want the owner's permission to do that because it can be sticky, Um, but people will let you do it. And that is a little trickier because you have to do first month's rent, deposit, furniture. And so maybe that's like 10 grand. So it can be a little bit more expensive um, and more of a commitment to do something like that. But there are people that do full businesses where, they have just a bunch of rentals and they just re-rent them. So you can do that. And then the most expensive and more challenging thing is to buy a property. And it's usually the first thing people think about doing, but it's not what I always recommend. What's great about buying is that you get the equity. So that can be awesome. Um, But it's also that you need to put all this money down and do the furniture. So maybe you're looking at $50,000 or $100,000 just to start. And what if it doesn't work? So I kind of think like baby steps, you know, oh, that was a lot of me talking. <laughs> thanks. <Somebody else. laughs> yeah. Thanks. You know, that was awesome. Um, and that's how it typically goes. It's kind of like throwing you into the fire and then just rapid fire questions. And you did a great job. I mean, that, that was really, really good information. Um, and I learned something I wrote down was it Furnish Finder was a good place mm-hmm. for medium term tenants? Yeah. So uh, I think we'll be using that. Um, yeah, as you know, <laughs> yeah, the springs is kind of slow January, February, March. So we'll try that. Um, yeah. And even our own house, we have the same thing. We can't do short term rentals here uh, less than 30 days, but we rent out our basement 
And that would be a great website to find new tenants for our basement when the time comes. Um, awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us yeah. uh, and giving up your some of your evening. Um, yeah. Oh. If I send you the link for the podcast um, episode that I mentioned, can you get that to everybody? Because yep. I don't think I can find it fast enough. Um, Absolutely. And then yeah. I will put my my website if people want to get in touch with me. You can find me there. And then at Instagram, it's just my first and last name. And I answer all my DMs. So if you have more questions, check me out. We'll do that. Thanks. And cool. uh, I look forward to meeting you in Austin. I'm sure I'll yeah, see you down there. That'll be fun. And if you do organize something with some people, let me know. I might be able to come. You could drag Craig too. That's a great <laughs> idea. Yeah, I already dragged Craig. Uh, I wish I would have known you back then, but we had a Colorado Sheik's Freaks meetup. Um, cool. And Craig came and, and met a lot of the, everyone in this group knows Craig because he's been on twice and they love his book uh, as they oh, should. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a good um, book coming out soon about him doing like a failed deal. So yep. that should be entertaining. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll let, we'll let you go. And okay. thanks so awesome. much. Yeah, Take care. We'll talk so to you soon. And if you like this video and want to see more like it, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You should also go check out our website and Instagram, which are both linked below this video. Thanks again for watching. Now go and get your freak on.